Learners! Hola, estudiantes! So this week, we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo, and for the first time ever, Chef Chanco and Senor Chanco are joining forces for the awesomest Cinco de Mayo celebration ever. Cinco de Mayo uh, es un día de festival muy importante en los Estados Unidos y también en México. Originalmente era una celebración uh, en México, pero muchos uh, estadounidenses piensan que el 5 de mayo es el día de independencia uh, en México, pero no es, no es el día de independencia. Es una conmemoración de una victoria contra Francia uh, en una batalla en México. Um, y otra cosa interesante, el 5 de mayo es más popular en los Estados Unidos que en México. Es más popular en los Estados Unidos Uh, porque muchas compañías como um, Corona, 2X, uh, compañías de tequila, compañías de avocados, bueno, en español <risas> aguacates, um, han usado la celebración de 5 de mayo uh, para... Um, para para vender sus productos. Entonces, es un poco extraño que el 5 de mayo es más importante y más popular en los Estados Unidos. Y este video va a explicar un poco más. Cinco de mayo in English means the 5th of May. That's the day in 1862 when the Mexican army won a surprising victory over the French at the Battle of Puebla. They were outnumbered nearly two to one. Many people think Cinco de Mayo celebrates Mexican independence, but that's not actually true. Mexico had been independent from Spain since 1810, but was unable to pay its debts to Europe. France saw an opportunity to move in and claim territory. 6,000 French troops set out to attack Puebla, a small town in eastern Mexico but an underdog force of about 2,000 loyal Mexicans defeated them. Their heroism was a source of great pride for the people of Mexico. Today, Cinco de Mayo is celebrated more in the U.S. than it is in Mexico, especially in areas with large Mexican-American populations, like Los Angeles and Chicago. It is celebrated with Mexican food, mariachi music, dancing, and other special customs. Cinco de Mayo honors the strength and courage of the Mexican people at the Battle of Puebla, and a victory that seemed impossible. So to celebrate Cinco de Mayo, Senor Chanco and I are going to make tortas. And tortas are Mexican sandwiches. They have a very specific type of bread, and we're going to do some of our favorite fillings. So we're going to make that bread today. We're going to make a pork filling called conchinita pibio. We're going to make a salsa called salsa verde, verde, salsa verde, <laughs> um, and we're going to pickle onions. And at the end, we're going to show you how to put it all together um, and just how we're going to celebrate this awesome holiday. And throughout the video, um, uh, Chef Chanco is going to speak in English and I'm going to speak uh, certain portions, explain things in Spanish. So uh, Chef Chanco students can benefit from the culinary experience and my students can benefit from the language experience. And bakers, don't worry, when he's speaking in Spanish, there's going to be action, so you should be able to follow along really well. Hope you enjoy! It's time to make the teleras. So teleras are a uh, Mexican bun that are really awesome. They're really crispy and uh, have like this awesome crust on the outside, but then on the inside, they're really, really soft. So it's kind of like uh, hamburger bun meets French crusty bread. So they're really, really awesome. They're great for sandwiches like this. They offer a lot of texture. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to bloom our yeast. Uh, yeast is a living organism. It's a fungus uh, and it does really well with warm heat. So this, is, this is instant yeast. You don't have to bloom it. I like to bloom it, especially because my yeast is old and I want to make sure it's working and it's still alive before I add all the other ingredients to it. 
So we're gonna add that yeast to some warm water. You never wanna get your water too, too hot. You're looking for 90 to 110 degrees. Uh, any hotter than that, you're actually gonna start to kill your yeast. So yeast does best in warm environments, but hot environments will kill it at all start to die at 120 and will completely die at 140. Entonces, este proceso es muy básico, es fácil. Uh, solo se pone el levador en dentro del agua caliente. ¿Cómo así? Y la levadura se necesita Cinco o diez? Diez. Diez minutos para crecer. ¿Eso es todo? Oh, tengo que mezclarlo. ¿Está bien? Sí. Okay. Correcto. Bueno, la levadora está activada. ¿Está bien? ¿Está buena? Uh, entonces, vamos a formar la masa. Uh, primero, eh, necesitamos los ingredientes. Uh, primero, la levadora. Segundo, harina. Tercero, uh, una mezcla de mantequilla y miel. La mezcla está un poco caliente, un poco. Y finalmente, sal. Sal. Uh, primero, uh, se pone la levadura. Sal. La sal. Sí. Primero la sal. Ok. Uh, entonces, se pone la sal uh, dentro de la harina. Y se mezcla. See? Sí. Eso, se mezcla. So you want to put the salt in before and you want to mix that together. Salt in high concentrations can actually kill your yeast. Remember, it is alive. Um, so salt in high concentrations will kill it. So we want to kind of get it mixed in throughout so we never have a lot of salt coming in contact with our yeast. Segundo, se pone el líquido con la levadura. Todos. 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 Okay. Entonces, uh, se forma una depresión en la harina y se pone el resto de los ingredientes. La levadura y el agua. La miel y la mantequilla. La mezcla de Mantequilla y miel. Oh, eso es todo. Eh, entonces, um, esta es una masa um, y necesita amasar la masa. So by kneading our dough, what's going to happen is we're going to form gluten. And gluten is this really big buzzword right now. A lot of people are trying to not eat gluten, but most people don't actually know what gluten is. So wheat flour has two different proteins called glutenin and gliadin. And when you add liquid and some sort of agitation, like Senor Chanko is kneading right now, they start to form this protein structure called gluten. And it works very similarly to a rubber band. The more you knead it, the uh, stretchier it can get. And that's what gives bread its characteristic chew. Now, gluten is also kind of like a muscle. So just like with our muscles, the more we work them, the stronger they get. The more we work this dough, the stronger that gluten is gonna get. So if you were making a cake, you would not want a lot of gluten. So you would want to mix it for a very small amount of time. For a bread, we actually want a lot of gluten because that's what's gonna give it that really awesome chew that we love about bread. So we're gonna knead this dough for a pretty long time. We do have a little bit of extra flour, so as soon as it's mixed, we can give it a quick touch and see if it's still a little sticky, and it is, so we're gonna add a little bit more flour, not all of it. 
And the amount of flour you need to add to your dough often depends on the humidity of your environment. Throughout the world, everyone has different humidities and everybody's house is different and it's been pretty um, humid lately. <laughs> um, so it's nice to not add all of your flour to most doughs and kind of see what the texture is like. So send your chonko, you can go ahead and stop and kind of clean it off with your fingers and wash your hands. Um, and then we can turn it out onto our surface and really start to knead it and we'll show you that technique here in a second. Okay, so as you can see, the dough is kind of shaggy right now. So we're gonna really knead this thing to really get lots of gluten worked up. So I'm gonna pick up my dough and I'm gonna put just a little bit of flour on my surface, I don't want a lot. So how we do that is we take our flour and we kind of shake it across, not down, and we get a much more even spread than if I try to like just drop it down on the table. And then I'm gonna knead it with my hands and Senor Chanko's gonna explain. Para amasar la masa se usa esta parte de la mano para presionar la masa. Segundo, se gira un poco la masa y finalmente se usa los dedos se para revolver la masa encima de su misma. So this is a pretty long process to get the gluten that we need. So Senor Chanko and I are gonna take turns kneading this until we have enough gluten formed. Bueno, ya pasamos más o menos tres minutos amasando la masa y necesitamos saber si la masa está lista, está buena. Entonces, uh, necesitamos chequear primero se separa un poco de la masa, así. Ok. Entonces, se estira la masa muy suave. Bueno, necesitamos ver por la masa. Si podemos ver por la masa como una ventana, la masa está lista. Y sí, yo puedo ver la luz por la masa. Entonces, la masa está lista. Si la masa no está lisa, la masa se romperá y no está lista. Pero sí, esta sí está lista. Ok, so we have enough gluten in our dough. Senor Chanko did the window pane test and we have the right amount of gluten. So it's now on to our next step, which is called bulk fermentation. So I'm gonna show you how we're gonna set that up first and then I'm gonna ex explain it. So first I'm just gonna get a little bit of oil, just a little bit in my bowl, and this is gonna help prevent our dough from sticking. So it's just a very, very thin coat. You don't want any kind of pooling up at all anywhere. And then I'm gonna take my dough, just do a couple more kneads just to make sure it's nice and tight and rounded. 
the prettier rounded shape you can get right now, the easier it's gonna see whether or not this is rising and how much it's risen. So I'm gonna take my pretty side and I'm gonna put it down first just to get a little oil on it, kind of twist it and turn it upside down. And then I'm gonna cover it with a clean towel, otherwise it'll dry out. Um, and I'm gonna let it sit until it's doubled in size. So what's happening over the next probably hour or so is uh, we're doing what's called bulk fermentation. So fermentation is a process of yeast that's eating all the starches and sugars that are in our dough and it's pooping out ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. So that gives us two things. The carbon dioxide is air, which gives us the kind of air pockets within our dough and gives us rise and that's what's gonna make it grow. The ethyl alcohol is what's gonna give bread a little bit more complex flavor. So really in most breads you have flour, water, salt, and yeast. There's very little flour, uh, flavor in there. So this process helps give bread that characteristic flavor that we need. So this step is incredibly important. Um, so we definitely wanna make sure we let it double in size. The, it's gonna go faster if you're in a warm environment. If you're kinda of low on time, you can set your oven to 200 degrees. And then when it's at 200 degrees, turn it off and then put your your bowl in there and that'll create uh, what my bakers know as kind of like a proof box but a little bit simpler and it'll just go a little bit faster right now we can't do that because we have conchinita pibil in the oven so it's too high of an oven right now so we're gonna let it sit on our countertop until it's doubled in size um, and then we'll go from there okay it's time to take a look and see how our bread is rising Woo! and you see how it's gotten about double in size that means it is ready for our next step now, as our fermentation has happened, we've created some really irregular bubbles, and you might see them, um, but you'll definitely see them in my next step. If we kept those in place, our bread, final bread would have like giant holes and tiny holes, and it'd be very weird. Also, there's been a lot of carbon dioxide trapped inside this dough, and too much carbon dioxide can actually kill off our yeast, so we want to deflate it real quick but we still, still have all that flavor that was developed from the ethyl alcohol. So how we deflate it is everyone's favorite part of bread baking and that's punching the dough. So don't break your knuckles or anything, you're not punching it, but you definitely want to deflate the air. So you just take your fist and poop, and hopefully you can see how regular all those bubbles are. So there's a big one there, a tiny one, they're very weird shapes. Um, so you're literally just gonna keep punching until you've got most of those irregular bubbles out. And then I'm going to turn it off onto my table. And I don't want to like knead it or anything. I don't want to give any extra work to it because this is at a long time to rest. Our, I talked about gluten being similar to muscles. And it's, it's the same way as our muscles are work. They get tense. As we relax them, they loosen up. So our gluten is kind of relaxed right now and I want that because I'm going to kind of pre-shape it and then I'm going to let it rest a little bit. So first I'm gonna split up my dough. If I was doing this in the industry, I would use a scale to measure it out. But I know most people at home don't have scales, so I'm just gonna make it kind of into one flat, even piece, and then I'm gonna do my best to cut it into even pieces. So I'm gonna, I, don't know, I like to sometimes mark it first to make sure it's about half. So I'm gonna go in half. And then for each half, this is where it gets tricky. So this recipe makes 10, and 10 is a very tricky thing to do. So I'm gonna try and eyeball what five should look like, and that was pretty terrible. And that's why I kinda like to mark it first so instead of cutting it and then trying to piecemeal it back together, it's a little bit easier to do it this way. And if you wanted it to be a little easier, you could actually do these into 12s. So you would have done this in a half and then each of those halves into three is a little bit simpler. Um, but Senor Chaco and I have been tasting this conchinita over here and I know that we're gonna want a big sandwich. So. Cut that one into five, and in a second, I'll cut this one into five. 
but I'm gonna go ahead and pre-shape it first. So what I'm gonna do is kind of look for which side is my prettiest side, and this one's my prettiest side. I'm gonna put it down on my surface, and then I'm gonna take the sides and tuck them in to the center, which is gonna start to form a circle. If I turn it over, it's nice and pretty. Now I wanna create some tension on that circle, so I'm gonna take my hand and I'm gonna make a duck shape. <laughs> and I'm gonna be pushing pressure from right here and right here, kind of like trying to tuck the sides under. And then I'm gonna go with my hand. I'm pushing pretty hard, uh, and that's what's gonna create that nice tension. So I want a nice, uh, even ball. And I'm gonna do that for all of them. As I go, I wanna make sure I'm putting them in order of what I've done. So we talked about that, like gluten needing to rest. For us to do our final shape, we need it to rest a little bit. So this is gonna be the first one I shape um, when we're done. So I'll do one more so you can see. Pull in on my sides. Then I'll turn it over. And then I take my hand and I cup it. And I kind of take my pinky and my thumb and help tuck that dough underneath with a decent amount of pressure. And the pressure's not down, it's like down and under. So it's not like I'm flattening it, it's like I'm pulling in with my hand. So just like that. And I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of them. And then they're going to rest for about five minutes. And I'm going to do this one first when I'm ready to shape them. Okay, so our little dough balls have been resting for about five minutes. It doesn't take very long. So I'm gonna start with this one, because that's the first one I started with. And the terera roll uh, kind of looks like a football, so we want to taper it. So usually how I like to taper bread is kind of when I roll it, I roll with my hands at an angle, so the center stays fat, fat and the edges uh, get skinny. So the idea is that it looks like a football. So you can see my hands are not flat, they're kind of stretched out and I'm pressing a little bit harder on the outside of my hands to create kind of a football, just like that. And when you roll your roll, you kind of have a little bit of a seam at the bottom. So you just kind of want to make sure that you find that seam here, which is here, and make sure that that is on the bottom of your roll. Just like that. And then we're gonna get it in our pan. I'll do another one. Just like that. I'm gonna shape all of them and then I'm gonna cover them back with my towel and I'm gonna let them rise um, to they're nice and poofy, almost doubled in size. And then we'll go from there. All right, so our rolls have gotten nice and poofy, so I'm gonna go ahead and egg wash them. So in my bowl, I have a whole egg and a little splash of water, and I'm just gonna beat that. And what this is gonna do is gonna help make this really pretty kind of golden crust on the top of our rolls. So it's just gonna make it even more delectable looking. Just wanna beat that together. And then with a pastry brush, I'm gonna brush just a thin coat over the top. And then as the egg cooks, it's going to get so nice and pretty and golden brown like that. I'm going to do that for all of my rolls. And then I'm going to slash uh, some lines. And traditional terreras have two lines in them. So we'll see if I can do it just as good as people in Mexico can. So I'm going to take um, a really sharp blade. So this is a, like an exacto blade. Uh, that I've only used for cooking, not anything else, which is totally fine. If you don't have this at home, you could use a really sharp paring knife. A lot of times people will kind of grease it a little bit, kind of helps. But don't be scared, you kind of have to have some confidence and just do it. Um, you don't really want to make tons of cuts because you're scared. So I always think the first cut is the scariest. You kind of get a feel for it after you've done a couple cuts. So I'm going to do two cuts the length of the roll. Just like that. I probably could have gone a little deeper. That's okay. Again, the first roll, you kind of get the feel for it. And I have used this blade a little bit, so it's gotten a little dull. And again, that's all right. I'll try this one. I want it to 
the length of the roll, just like that. Once I've done this to all the rolls, they're going to head into the oven. So we're going to make the conchonita pibil. And cochinita pibil is this super delicious dish that we fell in love with when we were in the Yucatan. And cochinita means baby pig, and pibil is a style of cooking where it's wrapped in um, banana leaves and slow roasted for a really long time and really flavorful marinade. Um, sometimes it's even put underground and cooked with a fire underneath underneath the ground, which is crazy. We're not doing that today. We're gonna do it in our oven because um, we don't really want to dig a hole in our yard. Um, but that's what the dish is. Um, Senor Chanco, would you tell us a little bit about the Yucatan Peninsula? Claro que sí. Um, la península yucateca está en la parte caribeña de México. Está en la parte sureste del país de México. Uh, y es, un, es una zona muy tropical. Hace mucho calor. Uh, y en esta parte de México um, se usa un ingrediente muy, muy popular. Los recados. Wonderful. So, like Senor Chanco said, it's really popular to use different kinds of pastes in cuisine. So this is the one that's typically used for conchonita pibil. And this is recado rojo. See? Muy bien. <laughs> uh, so as you can see, it is a red paste kind of, oh, maybe that side? Hey, you can see it there. Um, these actually we bought on our vacation to the Yucatan. This is Recado Verde. Recado Marron. See? Marron? Sí. Sí. And café. 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 Café o marron. Sí. Um, and this is Recado Negro. So they all have different kind of flavor um, uh, things in them. The most common, and that you can actually get this here in the United States, it's called achote paste. You'll see it in the grocery store. So the big, the bright red color comes from annatto seeds. Um, and annatto seeds provide this really kind of earthy flavor, which is cool because we kind of get some of that earthiness when you cook it underneath the ground and we're not going to do that. So we're still going to get some of that earthiness today. Um, it gives some pepperiness and a little bit of bitter and sometimes some kind of floral notes. Um, but it helps really make a really um, complex dish. So it also, in just uh, or with the, the annatto seeds, you're also going to have some cumin in here, which is really common, especially in Tex-Mex cuisine. Um, pepper, coriander, or we might call cilantro here, oregano, very common in a lot of Mexican cuisine to use oregano, uh, cloves, and garlic. So in this little flavor packet, there's just like all kinds of awesome goodness. So you, we actually bought all of these pastes when we were in Mexico. So you go kind of like to your farmer's market and then there's, there's just like a guy and he makes all these really awesome flavor pastes. So very quickly and very easily, you can have these really, really flavorful dishes um, because these are already made for you. It's a really awesome way to cook. We are going to use the red one today, and it's very special because this is our last red one from Mexico <laughs> that we're going to use today. Also, the annatto seeds in this that give that color is often used as a food coloring in small amounts because it's uh, in a lot of big quantities. It's flavorful, but in small quantities, it still has a ton of color, and um, we actually got Anato seed tattoos <laughs> when we were on vacation in Peru, right? So Anato uh, grows from Mexico all the way down to Brazil. So when we were in Peru, um, our, one of our tour guides gave us some. Y Colombia también. See, sí. and you did your nails in Colombia with the Anato seeds. <laughs> um, but you can buy a chote paste in the in the supermarket and a lot of Hispanic supermarkets for sure. But you can also get it. Um, in grocery stores. This is one I just got from Kroger, um, which I've never done before, but it smells the same and that's from outside of the packet, so that's really cool. But you can also get, basically it'll look like a brick paste like this. In Espanol, mucho de los ingredientes uh, eh, son similares. Por ejemplo, um, este paquete uh, se puede comprar 
a supermercados o mercados como Kroger o como Food Lion. Um, uh, otras cosas. Uh, cilantro, cilantro en, en inglés, también en español cilantro, uh, orégano, um, chef chonco <laughs> dijo orégano, en español es orégano, uh, entonces es muy similar. Uh, uh, mi esposa dijo cumin, en español es comino, es muy similar. Um, y no tenemos uh, los paquetes de México aquí en Chesterfield, pero... ¡Sí! ¿Oh, sí? ¡Sí! ¿Dónde? Uh, in Hispanic supermarkets. ¿Oh, sí? Uh, but I've only seen the red. Ajá, uh -huh. oh, solo este. Um, el negro es el sabor, sabor más fuerte. Ajá. Uh -huh. Y el, muy caliente. Sí, picante. Sí, es muy picante. Uh, el, el negro es muy picante. Um, el verde es el... Um, es, es lo más fresco. Es menos fuerte. Uh -huh. Y en el centro, en el medio, uh, son... El recado rojo y el recado marrón. So the other part that's really important to continue to peel is called sour orange or sometimes bitter orange. It looks very similar to our oranges, by the way, this is not one, this is just regular navel orange. Um, but it's got a much bumpier skin and it's not as sweet. It's kind of like in between a lime and an orange. So it has those orange flavors, but it's also got some sourness. It's very hard to find in the United States. Um, some places that have really high uh, Hispanic communities you can find sour orange um, and sometimes you can find bottled sour orange juice which we've been able to do in the past. Senor Chanco is looking for some and I'm pretty sure we used it all because we love it so much. Um, but since we can't find it here and right now uh, we don't have any bottled version we're gonna do a combination of orange and lime for our mar- no? No, no lo, ten uh, no lo tenemos. Pero está bien. Vamos a hacer uh, otra versión uh, de la salsa uh, de, ¿cómo se dice? Naranja ácida, uh, o agria, um, the sour, bitter orange, es naranja agria, agria es uh, sour. Right, so we're going to make do and we're going to make lime and orange and that's going to be very, very similar to our sour orange. So let's make our marinade. Okay, so we're almost finished juicing all of our citrus, but I wanted to show you the best way. So when you look at your citrus, you wanna look for the stem in, and you wanna go, uh, you, when you cut it, you wanna cut across. If you cut this way, there's gonna be a lot of membranes fighting you, so you always wanna cut it this way, and you're gonna get the most juice out of it. Another thing that you can do is kinda of roll it and press on it, and that's gonna help you extract more juice from your citrus. Another thing a lot of people will do is they will microwave that, we don't usually do that in the industry just because it's a little time consuming and not all kitchens have microwaves in it. Um, but, whoops, excuse me. <laughs> Doing this can help. And then again, I find my stem and I'm gonna cut perpendicular to that line. So you can see all these little membrane segments. If we had cut the opposite way, we would've been fighting against them. So it's gonna be a lot easier. We have these citrus juicers that are handheld. They work really, really well. So you just put it upside down, the cut side down, and then you just squeeze it and all that juice comes out. And it's really easy. If you don't have something like that, your hands always work really, really well. So you can just get your hand in there. And if this was a lemon or an orange, or a, usually limes don't have too many seeds in them, but you wanna have your hand underneath to catch those seeds if you're using a citrus, it has a lot of seeds in it. En español, el, la palabra para orange es naranja. Y el vocabulario para lime es limón. Si sí, limón es muy similar a lemon, en inglés, pero no existe uh, el vocabulario para lemon 
en español. Solo se dice limón uh, para este y para en inglés lemon. Um, entonces, la naranja se corta como así en dos partes y entonces, oh, bueno, este no es muy grande, entonces voy a cortar, cortar el, la naranja en cuatro partes, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, y entonces se presiona para extraer, para producir el jugo, es jugo, muy similar en inglés, juice, es jugo, ok, jugo de naranja, uno, dos, Y si no tienes uh, esta máquina a la casa, no importa. Se puede usar las manos para presionar la naranja. Así. No es necesario tener esta máquina. Ok. Y tengo un limón aquí. Es más difícil presionar el limón. Y por eso... Se puede usar un tenedor para ayudar. Así. Y así es. Tenemos mucho líquido ahora para la marinada. Marinada en inglés es muy similar. Marinade. Muy bien. All right. So the last really important piece is going to be our paste. We're going to get that in there and then we're also going to add some salt. So Señor Tronco, if you could add some salt. That would be great. And I'm just going to... ¿Cuánto? Más. <laughs> Más. Más. Okay, está bien. So I'm just gonna break up this paste and you can see how it changes the color pretty drastically to this really gorgeous red. And that's gonna be it as soon as I get all these chunks broken up. That's gonna be it for our marinade. Okay. Vamos a continuar con el proceso. Uh, necesitamos preparar la carne uh, para la cacerola. En español, esta es una cacerola, como casserole en inglés, pero es diferente. Es una cacerola. En, el, en la cacerola tenemos la marinada con el jugo de naranja y el jugo de limón eh, y la sal y necesitamos preparar la carne carne para poner en la marinada uh, primero uh, este carne 
es parte de un cerdo. Cerdo. <risa> y es esta parte de un cerdo. Es parte de la pierna, pierna frontera. Uh, bueno, hay un hueso en esta pieza de cerdo, entonces necesitamos cortar la carne en pedazos así, más o menos. No es complicado. So what Senor Chaco is doing is he's going to break down this uh, pork roast into smaller pieces. So one, it'll cook a little bit faster for us so we don't have to have our oven on for forever. And two, the marinade can work in a little bit faster. So he's going to cut this up into two inch pieces. Yep, that looks good. Una pieza. Pieces, pieza. And he's going to put it in the marinade. Very important when you're doing this to cut them to very close to equal size so that the even uh the cook is very very even if you have really big pieces and little small pieces it's going to take a lot longer for those uh small pieces sorry the big pieces <laughs> to cook so this process that we're doing is very almost braising so braising is a combination uh, method where you use dry heat and wet heat so usually for braising you would sear off the meat in a dry heat and then you would do a low, slow heat in similar to what we're doing. So this is like half braising because we're not searing the meat. You could sear the meat, but it's definitely not important to this process. If we were doing it super traditionally, we would have taken this entire roast, we would have marinated in the marinade we already made, and then we would wrap the whole piece of meat in banana leaves, which you can do. Banana leaves aren't super easy to find. A lot of Hispanic and international markets in our area do sell them. Um, but Senor Chanco and I uh, are trying not to go to too many grocery stores right now with um, the fun stuff happening out there. <laughs> so we're trying to limit our, the, our exposure as much as we can, so we're working around it. But the banana leaves, they definitely do impart some kind of earthy flavor, some vegetal flavor, um, and can definitely help, especially when they do it underground, can help retain some, some moisture. So Senor Chanco is going to keep going until he's got all of this pork cut up. And we are definitely not going to get rid of this bone. So if you've watched my stock video, I showed you how to make chicken stock and shrimp stock. Well, you can absolutely make pork stock. And this is the south, so we cook with pork all the time, especially in Casa del Chanco. We are always cooking with pork. So we like to keep pork stock on hand, so we're definitely going to save that bone, put it in the freezer until we have enough bones to make a pork stock later. Alright, thank you Senor Chanco for chopping up all our meat, so hopefully you can see it's already in there marinating. In an awesome world, we would go ahead and marinate this for a couple hours, maybe even overnight, but Senor Chanco and I are hungry. So we're gonna go ahead and go in with this now. It's gonna be okay because we're actually gonna end up shredding this meat so all the sauce that's in there is gonna be all mixed together. Whatever container you put this in, it's very important that it's oven safe because we're gonna pop this in the oven. So the base as well as the top and the handle need to be oven safe. That's a, something that people fall into a lot is they think everything else is oven safe, but then the, the handle is not and it melts and that's no fun. Um, so you need to make sure it's oven safe and you do need to make sure that you have something that has a lid. If we were to bake this without a lid, the top of our pork is going to really dry out and that's not what we want. We want this to have a very, very slow cook, um, but we also want it to have a really moist heat. Otherwise it'll dry out and we don't really want that. So we want to make sure we have a lid and now this is going to go in the oven for a very long time and it's going to um, get really, really tender and it's going to be super, super flavorful and we'll show you what that looks like in a couple hours. Okay. Uh, ya pasaron dos horas, más o menos. Um, en el horno y la cochinita pibil ya está lista um, pero para saber si está lista o necesita 
tiempo adicional uh, se necesita probar la carne con dos tenedores. Si la carne se separa, está lista. Entonces, mira, se separa fácilmente. Mira. No hay resistencia. No. Se separa fácilmente. Otro. Sí. No hay resistencia. Está lista. Entonces, uh, vamos a separarse toda la carne igual que este. Ahora, toda la conchita pibil está separada en pedazos pequeños. Y ahora vamos a poner uh, algo de líquido encima, encima de la cochinita pibil. Y vamos a mezclar la cochinita pibil con la salsa. Sí. Este es suficiente. Hay suficiente. Hay salsa suficiente. Mira. Hay más líquido y vamos a usar este líquido después para el pan. Ahora vamos a preparar una cebolla para poner en la tapa, en la torta, mm, con la cochinita pibil. Ok. Uh, la cebolla no va a ser una cebolla normal, ¿ok? Vamos a, a crear, vamos a preparar una cebolla encurtida, a pickled onion. Las cebollas encurtidas son deliciosas. En los Estados Unidos, um, cebollas encurtidas no son muy populares, um, pero en restaurantes mexicanos, sí, en México, en México sí, uh, la cebolla encurtida es muy popular, especialmente uh, con tacos o con tortas. Um, aquí en Virginia, en los Estados Unidos, eh, es normal, es más normal preparar un encurtido de pepino. Es lo más popular. Uh, por ejemplo, un encurtido de pepino. ¿Sí? Se ve normal. Ajá. Um, entonces, un pepino encurtido se llama un pepinillo. Este es pepinillos. P 
pero pepinillos es una preparación que se puede hacer con muchas otras comidas. Por ejemplo, la cebolla encurtida, zanahoria encurtida, pickled carrot, uh, y hongos encurtidos. Son muy populares. Oh, en Asia, uh, el encurtido de jengibre es muy popular. Y aquí, en los Estados Unidos, uh, el encurtido de jengibre también es muy popular con el sushi. Mira, es la comida que se come con sushi. Está delicioso. Ok, entonces vamos a preparar la cebolla encurtida. Primero necesitamos vinagre. El vinagre es el ingrediente principal en todos los encurtidos. Es necesario. Entonces necesitamos una taza es una taza bueno este es un vaso esta es una taza y también esta es una taza entonces uh, necesitamos una taza de vinagre Muy bien, se pone la taza de vinagre en una olla, es una olla. Mira, olla. Olla. Segundo, necesitamos tres cucharadas de azúcar. Es azúcar. Azúcar, sugar, es obvio, azúcar. Uno, dos, tres. Ok, luego necesitamos una cucharada y medio de sal. Este es sal. Ok. Una cucharada. Más o menos. Y medio. Más o menos. Un poco demasiado. Un poco mucho. Y uh, yo voy a poner orégano, porque orégano es muy popular en México. Entonces voy a poner algo de orégano. ¿Está bien? ¿O más? Más. Más. Sí. ¿Está bien? Sí. Ok. Eh, entonces uh, se pone el vinagre, la vinagreta. para hervir. Ahora la vinagreta está lista, está hirviendo, está muy caliente. Uh, necesito preparar la cebolla. Primero se co corta esta parte. 
la parte más arriba. Así. Segundo, se pone esta parte boca abajo. Y se corta la, ce la cebolla de en medio. Tienes que quitar la piel, piel de la cebolla. Uno. Dos. Y entonces se corta la cebolla así para proteger los dedos se corta así Entonces, se mueve la cebolla así. Uno. No se mueve la cebolla. No. Se mueve la mano. La cebolla está preparada, está cortada. Voy a poner la cebolla aquí. Y voy a poner la vinagreta dentro. Ahora vamos a preparar una salsa. Uh, en español, salsa no solo es salsa para con chips con salsa. Salsa es en general hay salsa de tomate con pasta o con pizza. Hay salsa de todos tipos. En este video vamos a preparar una salsa diferente. Una salsa de tomatillos. Uh, tomatillos no son muy típicos en los Estados Unidos, pero son muy populares en México. Uh, los tomatillos se usan para preparar salsa verde, como enchiladas verdes, o pollo verde, o salsa verde. Salsa verde es salsa de tomatillo. Uh, el tomatillo es similar al tomato normal. ¿Sí? Se ve 
más o menos como un tomate, pero, un, pero es verde. Eh, pero el sabor es diferente que un tomate. Es como un tomate y un limón. Es, un, es como la combinación. Me encantan. Los tomatillos son fantásticos. Bueno, primero necesitamos cocinar todo, todos los ingredientes en el horno. Entonces, uh, tenemos dos jalapeños, tenemos <laughs> muchos tomatillos y tenemos ajo. Ajo es... No es oh, ajo. No es ajo. No es ajo. Es, es cebolla. Ah, es cebolla. Sí. Oh, lo siento. Es cebolla. Este es una cebolla pequeña. Cebollita. Es una cebollita. Sí. Sí. No, no, cebollita es green onion. Es una oh. cebolla. Pero es una cebolla pequeña. Sí. Ok. Uh, bueno. No necesitamos cortar la cebolla. No necesitamos cortar el alapeño. Pero el tomatillo no, no se ve así en la forma natural. Se ve así. Tiene una piel. Es un poco diferente. Es un poco extraño. Pero tienes que pelar. Tienes que remover, quitar uh, el, la piel. Así. Fácil. Así. Es fácil. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. So your taco, is it important to wash them after you've peeled them? No, sí. Ok, sí. <laughs> bueno, voy a lavarlo. Luego. You'll notice if you peel the tomatillo, it's got like a sticky residue and you want to peel that off. So then your taco set those aside and I'll wash them for him while he continues the rest. Eh, solo se necesita cortar el tomatillo. Así. Y ya. Entonces uh, voy a cortar todos los tomatillos y voy a ponerlos en el horno para cocinar. Uh, yo corté todos los tomatillos y ahora es tiempo para poner un poco de aceite y sal. Ahora voy a mezclar el aceite y el sal, así, y todo va en el horno. Ahora los tomatillos, los jalapeños y uh, las cebollas están listas, están cocidas uh, y voy a continuar preparando la salsa verde, la salsa de tomatillos. Uh, el proceso es fácil. Voy a poner todo en un batidor. Un batidor. Y voy a batir todo. Y eso es todo. Entonces, uh, voy a poner un poco de cilantro. Como así. Ok, más o menos.
Okay. Uh, voy a remover. Voy a sacar. las semillas del alapeño porque las semillas son uh, muy picantes ok entonces voy a quitarlos voy a quitarlas de los alapeños así if you like spicy should you leave the seeds in Uh, sí, se puede, se puede uh, usar las semillas también y no voy a poner eh, el alapeño final. Voy a probar la salsa primero. Okay. Voy a preparar la cebolla ahora. Voy a quitar el base. Eh, Voy a cortarlo un poco. Okay. Está un poco caliente. Quiero usar todo del tomatillo. Ok. Bueno, voy a continuar con uh, estos tomatillos y voy a batir la salsa y ya. Yo batí la salsa de tomatillo y cuando... La probé. Uh, necesitaba azúcar, mucho azúcar, como tres o cuatro cucharadas de azúcar. Y también necesitaba un poco más de sal. Uh, pero con los tomatillos y con los tomates normalmente se necesita azúcar. Okay, so our bread came out of the oven and this is the color we're looking for, nice and pretty and dark and golden. And if you're ever worried um, about bread, whether or not it's done, you can always take its internal temperature with the thermometer. So for this bread, we're looking for 190 degrees and it's nice and soft and fluffy on the inside. It's actually my first attempt at a tomato, so it's not quite as crispy on the outside as I would have liked, um, but we're all in this culinary journey together, and there's tons of baked goods all over the country that I still haven't made yet, so I think for round one, I did pretty good. Nice job. Thanks. So, Senor Chanco is gonna talk about how we're gonna assemble our sandwiches. Mm. Para hacer la torta, uh, primero, es tradicional poner el pan dentro de la salsa. Uh, me encanta esta parte de una torta. Entonces, voy a poner el pan ahí. Oh, ¡Qué delicioso! ¿No? Me encanta todo tipo de salsa. Ok. Es la primera. La segunda. El segundo va la carne. Yo voy a poner la carne como así, un poco más. Un poco más. 
más. <risa> mucho más. <risa> ok, esto es suficiente. Uh, entonces, se puede seleccionar uh, los otros ingredientes que quieres. Para mí, yo quiero todo. Entonces, voy a poner el encurtido de cebolla. So, bakers, these are the pickled onions that Senor Chanko made earlier. You can see they kind of changed in color, so I just want to make sure you know what those are. Y un poco de cebollita. Este en inglés se llama... Radish. En español es muy similar. Rabano. Uh, es muy tradicional en México servir, poner... Rábano en las, en las tortas y también en los tacos. They have this really awesome fresh crunch, which is really nice, and they also have like this earthy spiciness that can be a really, really great addition to a lot of Mexican cuisine dishes. Un poco de cilantro para mí. Y esta es la salsa de tomatillo. Eh, yo voy a poner un poco de la salsa de tomatillo también. Un poco más. <risa> es un sándwich con mucha salsa. ¿También quieres algo? ¡Ah! ¡Oh no! ¡Ey! Hey, ¡Caught it! I know my students know that it's not very food safe to have the handle inside of your food because uh, you don't want what you've been touching to be touching your food. So are we going to eat this thing or what, Senor Chonko? Okay. <laughs> I did not have to tell him twice, did I, you guys? In uh, Latin American culture, I know this was tacos, but probably with sa sandwiches, uh, you're not supposed to turn the taco, you're supposed to turn your head, right? So instead of turning your sandwich, maybe you turn your head? Pienso que es solo para los tacos. Only tacos? Fair enough. Let's dig in. Uno, dos, tres. Salud! Oh my god, so good. Mm. That's the best sandwich. It's all over my face. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Worth it. Okay. Feliz Cinco de Mayo! Adios! Adios!